Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, How One Growing U.S. County Protects Residents' Data on Amazon Web Services. My name is Juan Villa. I'm a Solutions Architect for Amazon Web Services, and I will be your host and moderator for today's presentation. Today's presenters are myself and also uh, a presenter from NetApp called Ilio Girardi, who's a Cloud Solutions Architect. Uh, for today's agenda, we will go over an overview of backup and recovery on AWS. So we'll touch on a couple of points about AWS services, features, and some functionality. We, we will discuss backup and recovery of data uh, swiftly and securely by using NetApp. Uh, we will discuss also legacy tape backups at a growing U.S. county and a major university, the customer story. Um, and we'll also have a Q&A at the very end of the presentation where we'll hopefully get an opportunity to answer some of your questions. And we, do. And we hope to get to all of them, but in the event that we don't, like I said earlier, um, we will do our best to really try to get to all of them. So the learning objectives for this presentation is we're going to discuss uh, about migrating from a legacy tape backup system, how to reduce data storage using inline deduplication and compression, how to embrace a modern cloud-based data backup solution using Amazon S3, and how to achieve enterprise class data protection and recoverability. So um, in the first five minutes of this presentation, I wanna talk real quick about uh, the, the schema of backup and recovery on AWS. What are some of our services that are available? Some of the challenges that exist uh, in the segment of backup and recovery and how AWS addresses these. So first, let's talk about some of the common backup and recovery challenges that are that uh, customers experience. Uh, the first of this is the, is is the need to control backups manually. It's actually very difficult to manually control backups for a multitude of systems. IT environments are very complex. There are numerous devices uh, with very different scale and timing requirements. Um, this often leads to a lot of configuration uh, that is actually very difficult to maintain. Um, and it can also be very expensive, um, especially as you try to scale to keep up with the demands for backup. A lot of these demands also change fairly quickly. Um, there's a lot of regulations uh, around how you handle your data uh, from a legal perspective, but also from a government regulatory perspective. These things can change. Uh, scaling to handle this can be expensive. Um, and ultimately meeting compliance requirements is very important. Um, so it ends up being one very big worry at the top of uh, a lot of uh, like engineers' minds when they think about backup and recovery within their enterprises. Um, so the way that we address this at AWS is by providing uh, a, a suite of services and partner solutions uh, that provide integrated um, services and solutions that work really well with each other. Integration is very important because integration translates to simplification, um, which means that you can focus more on setting your rules and meeting, reg and meeting your regulatory uh, requirements and all your internal requirements rather than worrying about the configuration and how to make things talk and work with one another. AWS provides a lot of different services that do work with one another and our partners integrate with these services uh, as well. Um, we provide very secure services. We provide uh, very basic things like encryption at rest in transit, as well as some more complex uh, like policies that you can apply on top of your data, on top of these services to further control access and data, uh, access to all this data. Um, these, the services are essentially very easy to maintain because there's no maintenance from the customer's perspective, right? This is all hosted by AWS. It is managed is technically a managed service, meaning that you don't really have to take, you know, be worried about patching uh, and making sure that it's not vulnerable to the latest bug that's out there um, or scaling it even, right? So, so scalability is a huge challenge with backups. Um, it's very difficult to predict how much space you are going to need. And when you're thinking about capital investments and purchasing tapes and purchasing drives, it can be very difficult to figure out exactly what is the size, the quantity and your requirements a year in advance or six months in advance. Uh, with AWS and our partners, uh, you have access to cloud storage, which is scalable and, it, and it'll scale up, it'll scale down to meet your, to meet your demands. Um, and we do this all for a, for a very low cost. Um, for most of our services, 
uh, actually pretty much the, the majority of them, they are metered services. You pay essentially for what you use. There is no monthly cost. Um, and partners leverage these services to then provide very, very cost-effective cloud storage solutions. Um, the three perhaps cornerstones of AWS storage solutions are Amazon, Amazon Simple Storage Service or Amazon S3, Amazon Glacier, and Amazon Elastic Block Storage. Um, with uh, Amazon S3 is our basic object storage service. Um, and on top of that, there's a lot of other functionality um, that allows you to control access to objects individually by providing uh, access control lists, uh, providing IAM policies. There's a lot of mechanisms um, that you can leverage to govern your data more effectively. Uh, and perhaps most importantly here is that this is a very cost-effective service and very easy to consume. A lot of our partners will use this as the underpinning service for storing data. Um, we also have Amazon Glacier. Amazon Glacier is our cold storage solution um, where we can offer even lower costs for storage. Uh, and we store your data in a durable fashion. Um, and it's meant to be, like I mentioned, for cold storage, meaning that it's not for rapid access. It's not something you'll get, you know, a second or two seconds after storing. Uh, it's along the lines of five minutes to four hours, depending on the configuration. But it's, it's very effective for very massive amounts of archiving for compliance reasons, for example. For data that you need to store, but you might never need it. But just in case you need it, you store it for compliance reasons. Um, we also have Amazon Elastic Block Store. This is the, the underpinning service of our EC2 service. Um, these are essentially uh, cloud block drives. So, the, so this is block object. This is not uh, object storage. This is block storage. Um, it's essentially like a network attached volume. Um, if, you, if, if you're all familiar with VMware solutions, for example, um, this is a network attached volume that you can attach to EC2 instances. You can define the size that you need. You can actually resize the volumes as well, and they are stored in a highly available fashion um, in our data centers across multiple availability zones, actually. So Amazon S3, a little bit deeper here. Um, so it is a highly scalable object store. Um, you can access objects from anywhere around the world. Uh, you can even configure buckets to replicate uh, with other buckets around the world. So if you need even lower latency access uh, without using a CDN, you can actually copy objects around the world very, very easily. Um, all the data you store within one of our regions is replicated across multiple availability zones. And I'll talk a little bit about availability zones here shortly. Um, the, the data you store with S3 uh, is highly durable. Um, S3 is designed to provide 11 nines of, dur of uh, durability. So that's 99.99s after that. Um, you have, a, like I mentioned earlier, uh, access to bucket policies and access control lists that allows you to govern how your data is accessed um, and how it's not accessed as well. And you can even put requirements around things needing to be encrypted, for example. Um, we do provide uh, server-side encryption through different schemes. Uh, you can provide your own key. We can generate a key uh, in the data center. There's a couple of different options. You could also encrypt it yourself before uploading it. Um, when, uh, when thinking about storage with AWS, uh, most of our customers start with Amazon S3 um, when not leveraging a partner solution. Um, and Amazon S3 is really good for storing active data, data that is constantly being used, uh, that's being read, that, that's being written to. Um, so if you think about, for example, storing static assets for a web application, it's a very, it's a very typical place for storing those kinds of things or storing multimedia files that you're hosting on a website. <clears throat> those are the kind of use cases that, that lend themselves very favorably to Amazon S3. Um, but as you move down this arrow here, that represents essentially how you trans how you go from from active data or what we call hot data all the way to cold storage, somewhere in between both uh, active standard access and Glacier, we have um, an actual thing called a storage class with an S3 called infrequent access. Um, so for any object with an S3, you can actually change the storage class of the object. Uh, to something called infrequent access. And what that does is it allows you to store objects at a lower cost, but with a different billing mechanism. So with Amazon S3 standard, you pay for storage, and then you pay for S3 gets and lists and other S3 operations, but they're not 
correlated to the size of the object. So you can do as many gets or puts of any different kinds uh, and sizes of files. Um, and the important thing is that you're paying per month, per gig for standard storage, but in infrequent access, you're paying less for storage, but you're paying more for access. So you're essentially trading the cost of access um, in order to get a lower cost of storage, which is really good when you're storing 100 gigs and maybe you only need to access one gig a month. Um, so that makes infrequent access very, very valuable. It's also very fast because it's not cold storage. Um, and then the next step along the line is Glacier. And Glacier is absolute cold storage. Um, and this could take anywhere between five to, to four hours to recover your data. You actually decide um, uh, how you want to retrieve that data. The quicker you retrieve it, it costs a little bit more. But the, but the storage costs uh, are actually very, very low. Um, so I, I mentioned earlier an availability zone. An availability zone is a concept that we use uh, to essentially delineate between complete isolated environments within a region. Here is a map uh, of all of our different regions. And in fact, uh, since the day that this, that, that this webinar was authored, which was not very long ago, um, this has already changed again. Uh, so some of these new regions that are coming soon are already online and operational. Um, and we have some new regions that are not even shown here that are also coming soon. So that just shows the pace of innovation that, that, that uh, we have and how quickly we are expanding to provide better access around the world for, for data and for, and for applications. Um, a single availability zone um, provides uh, all of our services. And if you have multiple availability zones, you have redundancy and isolation. Multiple availability zones are built across different fault planes, across different uh, network infrastructure, power infrastructure. So we do our best to isolate these availability zones as much as possible within a single region. Uh, so when I mentioned S3, S3 is considered a region, uh, a region-wide service, meaning that everything you store in it is automatically replicated across all the availability zones within that area. Uh, which means you get absolute high availability within the area. But if you need geographic redundancy, you can also replicate between our regions. Uh, one thing that uh, we talk with our customers a lot about, uh, and one thing that we encourage our customers to really review closely is what we call the AWS shared responsibility model. In this model, we ask that our customers be in charge and be very attentive and very careful about their design of anything that is application layer, operating system layer, and up. Um, AWS provides a lot of building block services like EC2 for compute, S3 for storage, RDS for databases, and a whole lot of other services. We manage these services. We manage the security of our data center. We manage the security of our networks, the maintenance and management of these services. But anything a customer builds with these services falls within the uh, within the purview of the customer. And this is what we call the shared responsibility model. And it is very important to understand where this delineation is to make sure that, you know, that 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 uh, nothing is dropped along the way, especially when dealing with regulatory compliance and security. Um, we also, uh, at, at, at AWS, we have a lot of customers in a lot of different highly regulated uh, environments. For example, HIPAA being one of those really big ones, FedRAMP. Um, we have a lot of customers that need to meet uh, some very stringent regulatory requirements. AWS regions and a lot of our AWS services have already all been fully vetted and are compliant with a lot of these, uh, with, with all these certifications and governance and compliance around the world. They have different titles and different names and different meanings. Um, and this is just a very small sampling of them. We actually uh, have worked with and support a much larger number of these. But uh, with that, um, this really does conclude this quick introduction uh, to storage on AWS. Uh, at this point, I, I want to hand it over to Elio uh, from NetApp, who will take us through uh, some information on the NetApp solution and the customer story. Thanks, Juan. Take me just kind of, uh, control this. Okay, so uh, thanks everyone for attending. Uh, my name is Elio Girardi. I'm one of the cloud solution architects based out of New York City. Uh, I've been with NetApp uh, going on 13 years, um, and I am part of uh, the cloud business unit, which is a separate business unit within NetApp that focuses 
primarily on our cloud portfolio offerings. So, um, you know, if, you, if anyone on the call knows NetApp, right, we've, we've traditionally been known as, you know, a hardware storage company. Uh, it's kind of what we've been doing for the last 25 years. But, um, you know, we, we've done a great job at providing easy ways for customers to manage data. And we decided early on not to compete against the large hyperscalers, you know, the AWSs of the world. Uh, but well, it, it, we, we decided to partner with them instead, right? Um, and, and a great portion of, um, you know, of the network that we found customers were really struggling with was really this backup and recovery and, and, and data that was backup and archive data that was sitting on primary storage. Uh, a lot of customers had, um, you know, these, these huge tape library, tape library environments. Um, they were looking for alternatives. Uh, you know, to replacing these tape environments, um, and, and NetApp basically stepped up, and, and, and we introduced an offering uh, called the uh, NetApp uh, Alpha Vault. I'll talk about that uh, in the next com in the upcoming slides. So um, I, I, I am a cloud architect here. I, I do have a lot of discussions with many customers around, you know, the types of data uh, uh, and workloads that they would like to move to the cloud. Um, if you look at the slide on the screen here, the the, the, the biggest candidate. Um, or, or the easiest candidate to move to the cloud is traditionally data backup and archive. Uh, this is data that's, again, sitting on you know, really expensive disks. And, and now, nowadays, uh, more and more customers are moving to flash, right, as their primary storage, their tier one storage. So um, this data backup and archive data um, that you know, sits on this, on this spinning disk or flash um, doesn't really get access or looked at for long periods of time, but you still have to keep it around, right? Lots of healthcare uh, companies, right, have to keep this data for, you know, the, the life of the patient and then some. Um, so, you know, it, it becomes, you know, a, a real headache for, for customers to really manage this data. Um, and ultimately, it takes up a lot of space, right? They just have to keep adding, you know, additional drives to, to store this. So um, it becomes, again, that, that real easy candidate, right? for, um, you know, the C-level executives to say, hey, you know what, you know, we, we want to start uh, looking at a cloud alternative here for some data. What data can we move? Which is the quickest and easiest we can move? And data backup and archive really becomes that candidate. Uh, disaster recovery is a close second. Um, I definitely am having more and more conversations around disaster recovery. Um, it's a lot easier to just point you know, your systems to, to a virtual system or a virtual NetApp sitting in, in, in Amazon and create a, a, a DR uh, scenario, right? Really, really easy to do that. And um, again, our cloud portfolio uh, is pretty, it's, it's growing uh, at an incredible speed, uh, but does provide a lot of these options for pretty much all of these workloads that you see on this list here to help move customers to the cloud, consume cloud resources. So what is AltaVault? So uh, I want to start by saying AltaVault is being uh, renamed. Uh, it will be uh, called Cloud Backup. So any literature that you'll see on our NetApp uh, website will will refer to it as cl as Cloud Backup. Um, and really, it's it's an it's it's offered in three flavors. Uh, there's a physical appliance, there's a virtual, and then there's a cloud based uh, uh, instance. And, and what it does is it ties into your existing infrastructure. Um, you know, your existing backup infrastructure easily and seamlessly, and it allows you to really replace your, your tape uh, backup environment. It then takes that data, uh, encrypts it, dedupes it, um, and compresses it all in line, um, and, and can write it to AWS really efficiently. It can move it to a cheaper alternative like Glacier. Um, and, and this is a real big value prop of, of our Alpha Vault uh, offering is this ability for customers now to really start to take this data that, again, they really don't look at but need to keep around for a long period of time and move it to a really cheap alternative like Glacier. Um, and again, um, it ties into all of your uh, leading backup software uh, offerings, right? So it, it, you don't necessarily need a NetApp on-premise to, to integrate in with the uh, uh, NetApp Alpha Vault, right? This can tie into any environment uh, or any, pretty much any backup software uh, or vendor that's out there. So, um, you know, some of the features of the Alpha Vault is really this ability to do in-flight encryption, right? And, and it does dedupe and compression in line so that, you know, it takes this data, right, crunches it, and basically writes it in a real efficient format out to AWS. 
Um, so it, it helps to save on the back end for the amount of storage that actually needs to be stored in the cloud, right? So, um, you know, one of the uh, uh, use cases that we'll talk about, you know, a customer, uh, uh, King County, right? Uh, they, they saw uh, efficiencies of seven to one, right? They basically saw, you know, a seven to one data reduction, right? By using AltaVault uh, to write to the cloud, right? And it's, again, it's all built in technology that, you know, you really don't need to do anything to, to enable it. It's all on these people. So what does the ecosystem look like? Again, it's pretty vast uh, and, and pretty easy. Um, it, it ties into pretty much every backup vendor that's out there. Um, and it's available really in, in, you know, many formats, right? A physical version, uh, a virtual version and, and a cloud-based version, right? The advantage to this cloud-based version is, and it's funny, I, I just had a conversation yesterday with a customer, one, a large insurance uh, uh, services company that um, they wanted to use um, the out of -the cloud appliance to, to basically create a backup of their on-premise environment, then move it to AWS and then spin up a, a, a virtual backup uh, environment in, in AWS and then recover all of the data that they backed up to their um, AltaVault on-premise in the cloud. Uh, and, and, and the AltaVault in the cloud offers that, right? It gives you that ability to do that. So how can we help, right, with things like disaster recovery? So let's say you have, you know, uh, your, your on-premise environment backing up to, uh, in this example, a physical AltaVault appliance. Um, if there's a failure there, right, you can basically uh, recreate that entire environment in AWS, right, and just spin up this cloud-based storage appliance and recover that data in AWS. It provides a real easy mechanism for, you know, disaster recovery. What about if you actually wanted to just recover in another location? Um, you can actually spin up a, 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 a virtual out the vault in another location and it gives you another dr alternative um you know in, in a customer's environment right in another location with our virtual clients so th these are the speeds and feeds of the offerings again based on the amount of performance that you're looking for really how much data you're looking to back up will will really drive um, the offering that you know you you, you would go with um, again if you look at you know, really the, the logical capacity, right, that's stored, it's pretty large, right? But for the actual amount of capacity that you're, you're consuming, it's, it's, it's a lot less, right? So again, this is the one big benefit of AltaVault, right, is that I basically pump in lots and lots of data, but then I write a really small, for, reduced version of it, right? So um, in the long run, I save money on the back end because I no longer have to write, you know, the, the exact copy of the data that I have on premise, uh, you know, to another location, right? It's, it's in a reduced format. Uh, again, you know, virtual appliances are available uh, across pretty much all of the different, uh, uh, you know, VM type of uh, virtual hosts, uh, Hyper-V, uh, KVM and VMware. Um, and again, and then you also have, uh, you know, a cloud-based uh, uh, version of it that's available in the AWS marketplace. So, um, you know, it's very easy for you to, uh, to, 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 to spin up an instance of the virtual uh, appliance. Uh, basically, all you do is go to the AWS Marketplace, and it's available there. Uh, you pick your, your size, um, you know, the, and the amount of performance that you need and capacity, and then you can just basically uh, consume it uh, as fast as uh, you can just click through the Marketplace. Um, the great thing about AltaVault is that it's very easy to, to get up and running. Um, again, you know, for, for our customers, we basically uh, show them the ability to, to create uh, or, or, or demo the, the environment within, you know, 60 to 90 minutes. So it's pretty quick and easy. So I'll jump into now some uh, existing customers, right, and some of the use cases around uh, our cloud backup or out of the plans. The first is King County. Um, so. King County, uh, they're a large, they're one of the largest counties in, in Westchester, uh, in Washington State. Um, they serve over 2 million citizens. Um, they have about 13,000 employees. Um, you know, just like enterprise customers, right, they are a service provider to various departments and, and organizations, right, within the, in the county. Um, and, and they did have a real need to, you know, digitize, right? So, 
you know, again, I see this happening more and more often. I, I just got an email yesterday from, you know, uh, Department of Motor Vehicles here in New York saying that they're no longer sending out, you know, uh, physical mailers for registrations for your vehicle. You now do that all online. So, again, a lot, you know, th this conforms to, to what King County, right, is, is wanted to, to really help create. Uh, the other uh, case study is the University of Wollongong in, in Australia. So uh, they were founded in 1975. They are one of the top research uh, uh, facilities in the world. Um, they, they do have multiple locations throughout uh, the Asia Pac region. Um, they have over 32,000 students and, uh, you know, uh, almost 2,500 faculty members. Uh, again, you know, their, their main uh, data concern, right, is this research data, right? So protecting this research data and the security around it. So um, if you look at both of these case studies, um, there are some pretty common challenges. And, and again, and it's not just these two customers. This is pretty much, you know, across the board. Um, you, you have this aging tape infrastructure, right, that's really costly to maintain. Uh, so you need a staff that needs to be, you know, uh, available for fixing things like tape jams or, or robot arm, you know, uh, uh, misalignments, right? Um, these huge silos, right, have to be hosted in a data center, right? So you have to pay for the space of, of these of the tape silos. Um, and, and what happens to the tapes if you need to ship them off site, right? There's always the, the, the concern around security, right? Or, you know, if, if the tape actually is stored in a location that maybe has an issue uh, for restoring, right? Or maybe the tape can't be restored. Like right, there's a lot of concerns that customers have around, uh, you know, media, right? This type, this type of uh, backup uh, uh, technology, and it's slow. I mean, let's face it, right? You know, tape libraries have been around for a long time, but the technology, although so the drives have gotten faster, uh, it still takes a long time, right, to restore from a tape drive. So, um, you know, in, in regards to complexity, uh, this is what King County uh, tape backup environment looked like prior to AltaVault, right? So again, this is pretty common, right? And, and I see, and I have conversations with lots of customers that, again, struggle with this same issue, right? Is that, you know, there's lots of pieces, lots of moving parts to this backup environment, right? And, and really, there's a lot of overhead associated with it. Um, and, and what happens when it ages, right? Do you go out and now have to refresh this entire environment for, you know, millions of dollars? But typically, that's what it costs. So um, again, just looking at this diagram, right, you can you can really see the the complexities, right, that are built into, you know, again, this is King County, uh, but it's pretty common across other customers as well. And this is what it looked like after Alpha Vault, right? Great reduction in complexity, right? So if if you look at you know this diagram now, um, it, it really provides a lot easier management, right? It also reduced costs, right? Because I now um, only need four alpha bolt appliances instead of this huge tape library. Um, what it also allows you to do now is to, um, so the University of Wollongong, um, when they went to alpha bolt, it allowed them to begin testing DR scenarios uh, in, in real time, right? So I base, they basically take their alpha bolt, they back them up to the cloud, and then they spin up a cloud instance and test DR and AWS. Right, so it gives them a real time picture of, hey, what happens if a disaster actually does occur? Can we get the data back? What are we doing wrong? What do we need to change? Right, so it really helps customers build, you know, a, a really good run book, right, for for their DR testing. Um, you know, it, it it also replaces again lots of um, you know moving pieces here, right? So um, it easily integrated for King County into their existing V backup uh, environment, right? So you know, the cool thing about the Alpha Vault, right, is it recognizes that, you know, it has the APIs that recognize the, the, the built-in, you know, backup applications, right, and how they work. There's a SIFS and, and, and NFS front end for the Alpha Vault, right, so it can easily uh, integrate in with these backup uh, vendors, right, to, to, to work with it seamlessly. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, some of the numbers, right, um, again, you know, for King County, um, Obviously, reduce that complexity. If you look at those slides, you can you can see just by looking at the slides of, of, of how much easier it's now gotten for them to manage this environment. It simplified their disaster recovery, right? Again, you know, 
moving to this environment right now basically gives them a lot of alternatives, right, when it comes to disaster recovery. Um, it, it also reduced the data, right, that they needed to write because of the alpha vault efficiency features uh, and security features, right, they basically were seeing seven to one data reductions, right? So some so pretty good, you know, numbers, right, and, 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 and really help them save in the long run. Uh, lots of customers ask, um, you know, how does this compare to, you know, a, a tape library, right? Because a tape library does, it, it can, you know, perform at high speeds for, you know, ingest. Um, and, and these are some of the real life numbers, right? So, so these are numbers on our Alpha Vault 400, which is our lower end of our physical appliance. Um, and we saw speeds, you know, greater than uh, the uh, the ingest of a, of a tape library, right? So you can get, you know, all the speeds you need from our alpha vault. So it's a, it's a perfect replacement for a tape library environment. So King County saved um, over a million dollars, right? Simply because they didn't have to go and refresh this aging tape uh, library infrastructure. Um, it, it also it also helped them save over three hundred thousand annually, right? Because of you know they didn't need to purchase more tapes, right? And and then store those tapes and figure out you know uh, or recover for those tapes on on a daily on a, uh, on a continual basis just to ensure that they can recover those backups, right? So you know the the cost of management was greatly reduced, right? And it goes into those cost savings. Um, and again, it cuts your backup windows uh, drastically, right? Because I now right, am writing to um, disk, in essence, right? If you're using the physical, um, and then basically your recovery times are so much greater because I can now recover uh, easily from either the physical or I can recover from the cloud. I don't have to wait for, um, you know, tape drives to spin up and, you know, start to read labels and then, you know, finally ingest the data that you're looking for. Uh, for the uh, University of Wollongong, again, um, you know, the the retrieval times, right, went from hours to minutes, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a big advantage, right, for customers that, you know, are looking to have a, a cached copy of this data locally just for local, uh, um, um, you know, recoveries, right? So we have lots of customers that ask us about, you know, can I do a uh, just a cache of 60 days of data just to ensure that, you know, I can recover the data if I have to, you know, in, in, a, in a quick, easy format, and, and, it, and you can. Um, security, right, was a big concern for them, right? They basically uh, were looking at, you know, how do I ensure that this research data, right, isn't compromised, right? And, you know, the Alpha Vault does AES-256 uh, uh, encryption, right, so that, you know, you, you can check that box off because it's basically all encrypted. The data is encrypted in flight, right? right? So there's no no concern around that. And again, um, just the reduction of the overall tapes, right, that you need to manage and the tape library, right, um, is, is a, a quick TCO on out the wall. Okay, it looks like uh, I may have lost my uh, ability to switch slides. Can you just... Um, Click on the next slide, thanks. So um, I've reached the end of uh, my presentation. Um, I hope that this was helpful in understanding, um, you know, our cloud backup technology. Again, NetApp, um, you know, has multiple offerings in the cloud. Um, this is just one of them. We, we have a pretty tight relationship with AWS. And if you look at the marketplace, you'll see lots of NetApp offerings in the AWS marketplace. All right, perfect. Thank you very much, Elliot, for, for sure. that really good presentation. Um, so we have now reached our Q&A section. Um, we have gotten a few questions already throughout the presentation. Thank you for sending those. Um, I've had an opportunity uh, to, to, to answer some of those already. If you have any additional questions, feel free to continue submitting them um, throughout our Q&A section, and we will do our best to try to get to them. Um, so to kick this off, I want to get started with a question for AWS here. Um, the question uh, around uh, what is this 10 gig connection uh, to AWS that was represented in one of the diagrams? Um, so <clears throat> I want to talk real quick about uh, the multiple mechanisms that customers can access AWS um, and connect with AWS services. 
AWS services um, are all publicly accessible on the internet. So the, the most common way of accessing them is just over the internet by leveraging your internet service provider's connection, right? So you can do this from, from your home or from your business. Um, and uh, the path that the packets and the connection takes over the, over the complex network that is the internet um, is defined by internet service providers and carriers and a few other variables along the way. For, for most customers, this is okay, um, but, but for some of our customers that have very advanced workloads where they need a consistent latency and they need even reduced cost um, because traffic over the internet does cost. That's not free, unfortunately. Um, and, uh, and also for reliability, um, a lot of our customers choose something called a, uh, AWS Direct Connect, um, which is a dedicated connection offering from AWS that allows customers to pick between a one gig or a 10 gig connection. Um, and with this one gig or 10 gig connection, they have dedicated connectivity to AWS and, and AWS services. So they can access services such as S3, for example, um, via this pipe as opposed to over the internet. Um, and that does translate to reduce costs um, for very large volume workloads because uh, traffic costs over Direct Connect is cheaper than traffic costs over the internet, not to mention latency is lower and more predictable. Um, so, th so this is a very typical uh, thing for a lot of our customers that are like enterprise customers, for example, that leverage AWS for cloud backup, but it is not a requirement. Um, and you can actually accomplish quite a bit without even using a direct connect. So it is by no means a requirement, but we do recommend it for our customers. Um, so hopefully that answered that question. Um, I, uh, and with that, I want to move to another question here. Uh, I want to actually ask NetApp here a question, see if uh, uh, Ilio can maybe answer this question. Um, so there's a question about uh, data reduction. Um, uh, the NetApp software, the NetApp offering offers this concept of deduplication and compression of data before it's sent to AWS. Um, can, can, you, can you talk a little bit more about that and how that works and why that's a good thing and, and how that translates to cost savings? Yeah, sure. So, um, so if you remember when you, were, when you were talking about, you know, the, the puts and the gets, right, the cost of puts and gets to write into AWS, there, there, is, there is a fee for it. Um, so what AlphaWall does, right, is it basically ingests the data. Now, again, your, your, compre your compression dedupe ratios will obviously increase as you write more and more data to it, right, through a, the span of, you know, a few weeks, right? Um, so, so day one, you know, you may see some small reductions, but, you know, come day, you know, 15 or so, um, I mean, we've had customers that have seen upwards of 30 to 1 compression ratios, right? So pretty impressive. Um, so once that data is dedupe compressed um, and encrypted, the, the, the Alpha Vault actually writes it in a what's called a slab format. So it writes it in these four meg slabs out into the cloud, right? So that it reduces, right, that sort of put get, you know, cost that you, you put for every object, right, that gets placed in S3. Um, so it, it has, again, a, a really good efficient way of writing to the cloud. So it helps reduce costs in that manner. What you know, the, the amount of dedupe and compression ratios that you get will also help you save right on the back end that you for the amount of data that you actually need to store in the cloud. All right, excellent. Thank you so Good. much. Um, and we have here another question that I think is sort of for AWS and for NetApp. I'm gonna take a stab at it. NetApp, feel free to to jump in on this one. But the question is uh, whether customers need an AWS storage gateway to leverage the NetApp solution that you were talking about. Um, from the AWS perspective, um, the answer to this is no. Uh, AWS Storage Gateway is a completely separate offering by AWS that you're more than welcome to look at. Um, but the NetApp solution is a significantly more advanced and more capable uh, offering that does quite a bit more than Storage Gateway would do. We're talking about different tools for different workloads here. Um, but yeah, so I, I wanted to mention that. Not sure if, Elio, you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, so this in essence becomes sort of your cloud gateway. And it's funny, when you look at some of our slides, if you have a presentation from NetApp, um, you'll see that this cloud backup uh, device falls under our cloud gateway um, sort of section, right, that we have from our cloud portfolio standpoint. So 
Um, but you're, you're right, though. Um, you, you, it doesn't require any additional, um, you know, uh, uh, software or, or, or pieces, right, to get this data to AWS. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. Um, and here we have another question. Um, so the next question is, what sort of reports does the Alta Vault provide to show success or failure of backup jobs? Also, is there a report provided um, of what has been backed up and where it has been sent to in the cloud? Yeah, so so the Alpha Vault basically um, is an intelligent device in that it needs to sort of ma maintain, um, you know, really uh, an idea, right, of the, the metadata of where this 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 backup data is being stored. So um, it has pretty extensive reporting capabilities, right? So it's built into the appliance. Um, you know, if if it's if a customer would like to see, or if anyone uh, who's ever asked the question would like to see an example of those reports. Um, we, we we do have um, you know you can probably pull it off of um, our NetApp site or you can get in touch with your local uh, NetApp resource and they can help um, you know provide you some of the, some of the example reports for that. Excellent, thank you. Um, and we have a couple more questions here coming in live for NetApp. Um, we have another question here, um, and it's uh, does AltaVault connect with your existing NetApp storage appliances? Or do you need an Alta Vault appliance separate to this? Yeah, so um, so, so we, we we had an integration, and we currently have an integration with our existing NetApp environment uh, via a protocol called SnapMirror. Um, I, I think that is being investigated for more um, of a data uh, backup software integration point instead of a direct to NetApp uh, integration point. Um, you know, one of our product managers is actually on the line. His name's Chris Wong. He may be able to answer that a little more in depth if, uh, if you'd like to dive into that in a little more detail. Yeah, thanks, Elio. Um, hi, my name is Chris Wong, and I'm one of the product managers for the NAB team supporting AltaVault. Um, the SnapMirror protocol that Elio described is indeed sort of the data movement activity uh, protocol for uh, sending NetApp uh, snapshots uh, directly to AltaVault and through AltaVault then to uh, Amazon storage for long-term retention. Uh, we do support that today with existing ONTAP uh, versions of software which come with our FAS controllers and these are the file uh, controllers that uh, are the sort of the bread and butter of NetApp's um, storage offerings um, and we support that today uh, again with the all default appliance. Well, thanks, Chris. Excellent. Yeah, thank you Chris, I appreciate that. Um, we've got another question here again for NetApp. Uh, the next question is, is it possible to deploy AltaVault only in Amazon Web Services without deploying anything within the data center? Absolutely. Um, again, it just depends on the capacity, right? I mean, it really comes down to capacity requirements. Um, and, you know, how fast you, you, you know, or, you know, again, what your DR, you know, uh, recovery options are. Uh, but you absolutely can, right? Um, you know, the, the appliance that runs at AWS is it's running the same code that runs on our on premise gear, right? It's the same thing. All right. Excellent. Yes. Uh, all right, and uh, we got, let's see, got a couple more questions coming in for NetApp. Um, here is another question for NetApp. Uh, when deploying AltaVault within the data center, is there a minimum number of days of backups that must be stored on-prem before sending data to AWS? Uh, so, um, so, so that was a slide that I didn't show. So there's actually two modes of, um, of deploying the health of all. There's a backup mode and then there's a, a cold storage mode. So you can basically write the data immediately to the cloud if you wanted to do that, right? So um, there's an option to do that so that you don't need to store, um, you know, a, a, a backup copy on premise, right? There's a very small copy of it that remains on premise but the rest gets immediately written to the cloud. Um, or you can go for the uh, sort of that backup option where um, you can store, you know, a certain amount of data depending on the the, the, the capacity that's required on premise, right? So you have a local cache uh, to recover that data quickly so that you don't have to go to the cloud to recover the data when you have to. So you're, you're given both options. Uh, it's flexible in that respect. Yeah, and this is Chris. If I can just maybe add an additional, you know, color around your uh, your answer here. So, 
really a majority of users that uh, look at deploying all default uh, in a data center will want to have some level of recoverability of data that say has been you know recently uh, been protected uh, to the alt default and out to AWS so the, that cache that's available on all default plans is there to serve as that uh, near store uh, recovery point. And all the data that all defaults ever received is always available in Amazon uh, for recovery. We replicate all the data that uh, an all default receives to Amazon. So there's always the ability to recover this, even in the event of an, an outage of the alt default. You can again recover it to another alt default on premise or within uh, AC2 instance uh, deployed via the alt default uh, compute instance in the marketplace, Amazon marketplace. Cool. Thanks, Chris. Excellent. Thanks, Chris. And uh, here we have another question again for NetApp. Um, so the next question is what is the conversion process from on site tape and uh, tape storage solutions to cloud storage? Yeah, so, uh, well, so, so, you know, what, what method, right, is to reread your tapes, right, and then write it to the Alpha Um, You know, there's also a mechanism, right, that can actually get this data, right, where, um, you know, the Alpha uh, supports um, uh, Snowball, right, if it's, you know, if it's a question on actually how do you kind of get the data, right, to the cloud, large amounts of it. Um, Altavolt does support Snowball if it's something that, you know, you want to how to get the data to AWS. But actually, that may that may um, answer, I think, the next question, Juan, that uh, what just popped up. Perfect, yes, yes. And uh, and the next question that he's referring to is uh, when deploying Altavolt in, uh, yeah. only in AWS, Will backup software be be responsible for sending the backup data over the LAN to to AWS? So, so yeah, or you can snowball it if it's a easier mechanism. So this is Chris again. Um, let's let me uh, provide a little bit of clarity here. So, the the backup software is responsible for managing the data as sent to Altavault. Altavault is responsible for then obviously sending that data over to Amazon Web Services via the, your WAN link. Uh, the Snowball functionality that we're talking about here is Amazon Snowball offering, which provides the capability to basically provide a disk offloaded uh, storage of plants that you bring on prem and you basically load it up with a bunch of data that you're going to store in Amazon's object storage. You ship that back to Amazon, and then Amazon loads that into your object storage uh, target, your bucket, and Altafault will then go and then connect to that bucket, uh, more or less preventing you from having to move that large amount of data across the WAN. And this is very useful for use cases where you have a seed operation or a tape migration operation where you've just got basically a dump of a lot of data that you're going to do in a one-time operation um, and doesn't really reflect sort of the ongoing sort of steady state of your operations once you've got your data, uh, the main bulk of your data moved over into Amazon. So Snowball is a very good option if you, say, are WAN constrained or you have a uh, WAN link which is you know, not... Um, as reliable uh, for moving, again, large amounts of data. And that provides the capability, for, again, to move those workloads across uh, so you can reach that steady state more quickly and more reliably. Yep. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for the uh, yes. yep. And one thing I wanted to also add to that about the uh, AWS Snowball uh -huh. um, is actually I, I wanted to sh share a quote real quick with you guys um, from uh, one of the product managers uh, for Snowball that's actually been repeated. Uh, quite often, and uh, it it really ta uh, talks to to the to the reason for why the snowball was created, um, and and really ultimately the reason why it was created is because uh, UPS trucks and FedEx trucks have significantly more bandwidth than what you can actually really purchase. Um, when you think about these devices uh, called snowballs that we can ship to customers, these devices can hold 50 terabytes, can hold 80 terabytes. Um, of capacity on them, and uh, you can connect them locally, load them with data, and then send them out to AWS. You can order one or more of them, um, and when you send them back to us, we then offload that into an S3 bucket. So you've essentially skipped the part of traversing the internet or setting up a direct connect link 
And it's great, like you know, Chris mentioned, uh, for that initial seed uh, of data. And then once you've got uh, most of your data already available, then you can essentially keep it up to date in sync and replicated from that point forward by just leveraging your internet service provider's uh, connectivity. All well, right. there's also, hey, Juan, just yeah. real quick, I, I, you know, when you talk backup environment, it's usually petabytes, right? So lots of customers are like, okay, well, Snowfall's great. It does terabytes. How do I move petabytes? Well, AWS has snow, Snowmobile, right, which can actually move petabytes of data, right, in, into, into um, AWS, right? So you guys have an offer for that as well. Yep, and those are really cool because those are actually trucks. They are yeah. legit like eighteen wheelers uh, with security and everything. It's actually really neat. Um, if you if anyone's ever been to reInvent, uh, there's actually a, a truck parked there just as a showcase. It's very impressive. It's a great way to move immense amounts of data in a very short period of time without having to wait for that data to be copied over the internet. Um, so awesome. All right. Um, we got another question here uh, for Neda, and the question is, does the local cache get stored on-premise using AltaVault or SnapMirror use some method of compression or deduplication to reduce storage footprint? So, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it basically uses compression dedupe, right, as a, as a default, right? So you're saving that, on your, that, that storage footprint locally as well, yes. Perfect. All right. Um, let's see if we've got any other questions here. I don't think we have very many other questions. Um, let's see. All right. Let's go to some of the earlier ones. Um, so, can you share with us, like, what is a like a typical use case, like maybe one or two use case when a customer should use the AltaVault cloud appliance? Well, again, um, I, I think really, you know, if you saw from those use cases, um, replacing a tape library. Right, I think that becomes, um, you know, one one of the um, easier use cases. Um, but again, also if you're just looking to really start, you know, your cloud journey, right? There are a lot of companies out there, believe it or not, that still haven't, you know, started to use the cloud in any any format yet. So um, they're still struggling with how do I, you know, categorize and how do how do I basically um, look at the type of data? What type of data do I want to move to the cloud? Which which makes sense and what you know what doesn't? Um, you know, the Apple Vault gives them a real easy you know choice, right? Because it's this backup and archive data that becomes an easy candidate, right, to move to the cloud. So I think those are probably the top two that I've seen, at least in in, in the conversations that I've had. Excellent, excellent, and. Uh... And why would someone use AltaVault over, say, a competing product or solution? Well, again, um, you know, you, you you have NetApp, right? It's it's backed by NetApp, right? And again, you know, we we've we've been in the business for 25 years, and our sweet spot has always been data management, right? So, um, you know, the ability to, like Chris was saying, to integrate, you know, with our an existing on-premise NetApp system. Uh, as well as uh, this easy ability to integrate with, you know, pretty much any vendor, any software vendor out there, um, you know, just makes it a really easy choice, right? Because, you know, you, you, you don't have to jump through hurdles, right? Or jump over hurdles to try and get this environment up and running. And it reduce costs, right? It knows how to write to the cloud efficiently uh, in helping to reduce costs. Yeah, I definitely like to sort of speak to that last point, especially you know the Altaval has has many years of technological advances and really sort of the best in breed in terms of its capabilities to optimize that storage efficiency of the information that you're sending from your backup application that you need to go out to cloud for data protection. Um, if you look at the at the retention and data rates that you know backups have, um, you're going to be keeping this stuff for a long time, and you want to store that as efficiently as possible in Amazon to reduce the overall burden that your company is going to have, right? Um, well, in essence, also having the capability of accessing data quickly and easily as possible. Um, Altafall really serves purposes in both those uh, particular areas very strongly. 
through the storage efficiencies that are you know best in breed that again variable length inline deduplication and compression and then because of it being a disk based system you're not having to do a lot of disk manage or tape management um, for recalling tapes doing operations that are very manually driven when working with an Amazon you're actually going to be automating all of those operations and saving your IT infrastructure team a lot of time doing those data management operations Oh, excellent. Um, and speaking to the years of experience, right, this is something that Andy Jassy from AWS really likes to say, and there's, and there's a tremendous amount of truth behind it, um, and it's the fact that there is no compression algorithm for experience. Um, the number of years, the experience, the iterations, the working with customers on and off, the scale at which NetApp operates, at which AWS operates, um, is, is a very rare scale for others to operate in. Um, all these years of experience have truly helped us build very, very mature products. And we continue to innovate, right? Uh, neither of us really stop. Um, one thing we say a lot uh, is that we really don't stop until until we, until we are short of, of, of perfection. It's hard to achieve, but we try every day. Um, so thank you all very much. Uh, on actually, yep. Um, so for next steps, um, uh, please do check out uh, NetApp's offering, the AltaVault offering, which will soon be renamed, as I mentioned earlier, um, on aws.amazon.com slash marketplace. Um, you can also learn a lot more about NetApp at NetApp's own website at netapp.com and also more about uh, the integration with AWS at netapp.com slash AWS. Um, and ultimately, if you've never tried AWS, I encourage you to sign up for a free account um, you can try AWS for free uh, for one year. We have something uh, which is essentially what we call the free period um, uh, or free tier within within AWS for one year uh, where you can access uh, a great number of services um, just to check it out um, and get to experience it and learn about it yourself. Um, and so, yeah, with that, um, I want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar and thank you for uh, the excellent questions as well.